uh, we're going to start our webinar. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Dominic Brewer from Sound for Life. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for a webinar about dyslexia. So we are fortunate to have a special guest, Kim Worley Birch, a specialist teacher in the field and a mother of dyslexic children. Kim has used for brain extensively at home and at her practice. And she will talk about what she has observed firsthand, the clear benefits of Forbrain with the dyslexic community. So Forbrain is an award-winning device. It was developed by Sound for Life, a neurotechnology company that inherits its technology and science from the Tomatis method, a world leader in auditory stimulation. Forbrain helps people with speech and language and voice disorders, attentional difficulties, memory issues, and it stimulates the brain to improve the perception and the analysis of the sensory messages and integrate you know, the therapy uh, that you will you know, uh, put in place for them. Ultimately, it allows the brain to function more efficiently. So as a tool, it is a complementary technique to the work that you do in your communities, and it enhances the results by helping your clients to better integrate your therapy or educational exercises. It can be used in your practice, at home, or at school. So for many years, we have had thousands of professionals from different fields become affiliated with Sound for Life. They actively use and recommend both Forebrain and its companion headset, uh, Sensory. Sensory is a multi-sensory program that helps integrate motor and cognitive uh, abilities through a 40-day music and movement program. Each device has its own affiliate program, and we encourage you to sign up for both at forbrain.com and sensory.com. So this webinar is being recorded. The audio, video, and chat features are disabled uh, for everyone besides the host, and we will answer your questions at the very end of the session. You will see at the bottom of the Zoom platform the Q&A session. Uh, where you can post your questions. So without further ado, I'll turn the webinar over to Kim. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome. And thanks so much for joining. A um, little bit about my, well, uh, uh, Dominique's already introduced me, but I have a, a private practice. Um, I do diagnostic assessment. So I assess dyslexia. Um, I also, I'm a specialist teacher, so I work with sort of individual one-to-one -one cases. Um, and I do work with different types of specific learning difficulties. My primary um, sort of um, speciality is dyslexia, but of course you see that it comes with ADHD and dyspraxia um, and sort of dyscalculia, those sorts of things. I came across Forebrain about five years ago. Um, I'll talk a little bit about dyslexia in a minute, but one of the biggest things that um, I realized in all my research was that, that you can really make huge improvements in reading and writing and spelling when you get the sound processing right. And um, I do a lot of that work in my own practice. Um, and of course, when I found Forebrain, I was so excited because it was a tool that would really enhance um, and uh, the impact of the work I was doing and also make it so much more accurate. And I'm going to show you, you know, how I do that. What is Forebrain? Um, it's a, I've got a I've got a um, the headset here. So it's a it's a headset with a, um, a microphone. I don't know if you can ho hopefully you can see that. Um, so it's a bone conductor headset. Um, it's got these two little uh, bits that, that sit on your temporal um, bones. Um, and then there's a microphone that you talk into. And it's got a dynamic filter, um, which is, is clever. I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and then the, there's also a secondary microphone, which you attach to um, the forebrain. And the therapist or the parent can actually talk into that. And I'm going to show you how I use it. But basically, um, it amplifies speech in real time. Now, 
um, there's a, a, a natural process called the auditory vocal loop, and this is what forebrain works with. So this is the natural process, how we perceive, analyze, assimilate, and continually adjust our speech. And um, we use forebrain to make sure that when you're speaking, you are actually making sure those sounds are, um, are accurate. Um, so how does it work? Well, it uses amplified bone conduction. So remember the sounds going through our bones rather than our ears. And it's a really, um, for those of you who don't know, but we, um, we perceive, we hear sounds through our ear canal. Um, through the, the tympanic membrane, but we also hear sounds through the bones in our body and through our skull. And actually, because bone it, it, a sound travels 10 times faster in, in a solid than it does in a, a liquid or a gas, um, the sound is transmitted 10 times faster. And the important thing with greater clarity than air conduction. There's also really interesting... Um, a study on on the forebrain website about sort of additional benefits of bone conduction, um, but the so that's the these are these little bits here. That's where the sounds transmitted. The dynamic filter is this here, which strengthens specific frequencies of sound, um, and it also alternates. It's called gating. It alternates um, uh, the 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 sort of how the sound comes through. So it. it it repeatedly surprises the brain and that forces you to hold attention. Your, your ears have to keep sort of focusing and refocusing. Um, so there's an, an additional benefit of, of, um, of attention actually, but it's stimulating, making sure those little ear muscles work really well, work properly and accurately. Um, and then finally, the auditory feedback loop, um, which I discussed earlier, enhances the sounds of spoken words and it corrects how you hear your voice, um, which improves speech production and sound discrimination. Um, there's a huge amount of scientific research done on, on with Forebrain, some fantastic studies, um, and have a look at the Forebrain website for those. But what we can see is that you know, using forebrain really does help reading and writing skills. Now, in my practice, I've been using it for five years. I've seen the most tremendous um, results. It does help short-term and verbal memory. Um, it helps that ability to stay on task. So it's a fantastic tool when you when you use it for younger kids to get them to process um, sounds properly. But for older children, um, when they're reading or um, revising. Um, using the forebrain actually helps you pay attention while you read, which obviously then helps your uh, comprehension too. Um, and then the other wonderful thing is that it helps speech, pronunciation, and fluency. So your language um, can be more fluent, can be more accurate. I'm just going to give a little definition of, of dyslexia. This is from the Rose Report. This is the definition we use in the UK. Um, it's pretty similar around the world. And it essentially dyslexia is um, a learning difficulty, so specific learning difficulty that affects the skills involved in accurate and fluent word reading and spelling. That then obviously translates into uh, writing as well. Um, and your characteristic features of dyslexia are difficulties with phonological awareness. So that's sound awareness, being able to um, you might have perfect hearing, but you can't process sounds properly. Um, verbal memory and then verbal processing speed. I'm going to talk about each one of those individually in a little bit more um, detail. Dyslexia occurs across a whole range of intellectual abilities. Um, so just because you can't read or spell doesn't mean that you don't have, you know, sort of significant strengths in other areas. Um, and it's a shame that, you know, uh, you know, having weaknesses in the in reading and spelling creates a perception of of a lack of ability, and that's absolutely not true. Once we harness um, some of those core skills, you can start to see wonderful progress in children and adults, obviously. Um, so, I think the other important thing: it's a continuum. You get very severely dyslexic people, 
and very mildly dyslexic. And you could have very severe phonological awareness. You might have a good verbal memory. So, you know, no two dyslexics are the same. They all um, have their own specific profile. It's something I do when I assess is look at those profiles uh, and really go into the nitty gritty um, of the underlying uh, ability, cognitive ability, um, to be able to then fine tune, you know, whatever program you're wanting to use. Um, you do see co-occurring difficulties, language, motor coordination, uh, concentration, personal organization. Um, they're not at the moment markers of dyslexia. We're seeing a little bit of a shift now where we're looking at um, big, uh, um, perhaps slightly redefining the, uh, the term because actually a lot of people with dyslexia might have a little bit of dyspraxia and a little bit of ADHD um the, the, the it's called comorbid so you you get a lot of some you know you get a lot of inter interplay um and it's important to actually understand all of them um the british dyslexia association acknowledges this is another part of the this is a new relatively new um that you get visual and auditory processing difficulties part and parcel with dyslexia um and um, that they have strengths in other areas like design, problem solving, creative skills, interactive skills, and sometimes oral skills too. So you do get these wonderful strengths uh, next hand in hand with um, some of the difficulties. And, you know, it's important to work with those strengths while you're supporting the difficulties. I'm just going to talk about them a little bit more depth. So verbal memory, that is... Um, there's, there's a short-term memory, so that's being able to hold a, a very short bit of information, whether that's a teacher talking, giving you a set of instructions, um, or even putting sounds together to form a word. So at, you've got to put those three sounds together to form a word. Um, then we look at working memory, and that's that sort of ability to ha have everything you draw from your short-term memory, draw from your long-term memory, put it all on a on your desk, basically, and work with that information. Um, and so that would be, for instance, um, putting sounds together. You've got to hold those sounds in your head. You've got to put them together to form a word. Um, you've got to remember that if you look at this word decided, you've got to remember that C-I is a S sound rather than a K sound. Um, so you've got to bring information from your long-term memory. You've got to know, is it a B, is it a D? Because that could be confusing. Um, and you need to know that ED is, an, is a past tense. So that gives you a clue that it's something that's happened. You have decided about something. Um, you also, in terms of, so verbal memory is the big one with dyslexia, but you do get visual sequential memory difficulties, sometimes abstract uh, visual memory difficulties. And so sometimes seeing those letters can be a little bit confusing, seeing those words. Um, and then the storage into long-term memory can also be a little bit tricky. One of the big areas which, of course, forebrain is the most, you know, has the most impact is, is phonological awareness. So this is being able to really appreciate those underlying sounds, which you can imagine sounds is our language. Um, and reading and spelling are all about sounds. Um, and when when you assess a child, we, we do specific assessments looking at phonological ability. Um, and you can really see what's going on. Um, so that a, per, a, a child might might be, I've got the word octopus there, they might actually hear it as octopus rather than octopus. If you say um, cat, the a sound might be perceived as an a, so they're hearing cut. Now you can imagine, you know, specific, you say you're only hearing pacific, you're not getting the whole lot. And then in syllables, in words with multisyllables, you might miss out the middle syllable. You might just not be processing that correctly. Um, and then, of course, that links into spelling. Um, and you can see it quite clearly in spelling errors. Um, and this is the area where if you put targeted intervention into, um, the brain is so flexible and, and malleable. 
um, that you really see, start to see changes really quickly. So it's quite a nice, exciting thing to really to uh, target when you're teaching. And then the final aspect is verbal processing speed. So this is how fast you process information, how fast you draw information from your long-term memory. That can be a picture, a name of a picture, a name of something. It could be the sound of a letter, like k. Um, it could be a word. So when you see a word on a page, how long it In takes... Your, you're cutting off a little bit. Oh, um, is, is that okay? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear We can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, please just let me know if that... I don't know why that happened. Um, and, um, and then also it's drawing that information too. So words that rhyme, generating words that rhyme. So bringing that information from your long-term memory, um, from the, the language center of your brain to, to speak it. Um, so that's kind of a whistle stop to, obviously I could talk about these things in detail for ages, but uh, a really quick sort of explanation. So the impact then is on reading. It means that the reading might be slow. You might forget words. So you've seen the word saw, or, but you're reading it as was. Uh, or you, you see the word the on one page, the next word you can't remember what that word is. It takes a long time for those words to be, I call them glued in because it's a nice, easy way to describe it for children, but to cement into long-term memory. Uh, they have difficulty with sounds, they might guess words, uh, and they might not understand what they're reading uh, because they're so busy decoding um, the words on the page. And that's the biggest thing that we see is um, you might have this incredible you know, curiosity and a child who's interested in things, but when they read, they're not taking anything in. And that can be A, they've got an attention problem, or B, they're actually spending all that time decoding. And when your sound processing, your phonological awareness is, is weak, it's exhausting, absolutely exhausting. Um, so until you get that fluent and really get those skills automatic, reading is really tiring, learning to read. Um, in spelling, we see they forget patterns, they might miss syllables when they're writing, they might mix up letters. Um, and then, of course, that then filters into writing, forming your letters, getting started. Well, how do I even start on a page? Getting all your thoughts down. Um, how do I spell the word? You know, that's difficult. It does also filter into speaking, finding the right word to speak at the right time. You might be chatty, but when you've actually got to draw a specific word, um, it can take a bit longer. So you'll find they might say words like thing and stuff um, a lot. Um, and that's just because they can't quite get that word at the, you know, the exact word they want to use. And of course, it also impacts following instructions. Any background noise is distracting. Following a lesson is tricky. So learning. Basic skills take much longer to cement um, and they need a lot more repetition. I thought I'd just quickly explain why learning to read is hard from that dyslexic point of view. Mapping letter sound links is, can be really difficult. So just putting those sounds to those letters can take a long time to establish and they need a lot of intervention. Um, and um, drawing your sounds. So if you see that word cat, you've got to A, know that that's a ka, an a, and a ta those sounds, you've got to bring those sounds forward and you've got to merge them using your memory to, um, to string them together. Um, and if the speed of that is a little bit slower, there's going to be a little glitch. It's going to take you longer to remember it. Um, any irregular words, so you've got to learn that word as a pattern because you can't, you've got to remember the pattern T-H-E is the, you can't use a, you can't use a phonic strategy for that. Um, as I said, decoding is very tiring. And a word like no or on, if you know, you need to know that you've got to go from left to right rather than from right to left. If you're very good at visual pictures, sort of seeing in pictures, sometimes those little symbols on a page don't mean anything. 
and take a long time to learn. Um, and I think just as I mentioned earlier, if you're, if you're spending all that time decoding, there's no working memory left. Your working memory is just totally clogged up with um, that ability. So the fun part is, is actually understanding what you read. Um, and spelling, if we think of spelling now, it's again the same difficulty with mapping those letter sound links, how quickly you can draw that word, um, that letter or that word from your long-term memory. Um, you've got to combine sounds to form a phonic pattern. You've got to remember what those sounds are. And then if you've got any little fine motor difficulties, you can imagine that now you're thinking, oh my word, how do I even start writing that letter? Then I've got to think about attaching the sound to it. And then I've got to put it all together. So spelling can take a long time to, to remediate actually. Um, and, in, and, you know, I think when you, you know, in terms from a, from a teaching perspective, spend the effort on the, on the reading first. Um, I mean, if you look at that little fish there, the, the, the G-H-O-T-I could actually be fish because G-H is a f sound, can be a f sound. O oh, can sometimes sound like an E and T-I is sometimes a sh. So you can imagine there are all these different phonemes that you've got to remember. Um, and if your memory is a little bit tricky and then the sound processing is tricky, uh, it just makes spelling really hard. How dyslex, how for the forebrain helps dyslexic learners? So this is really um, the crux of the, you know, of the lecture. And, and when I go through my case study, I'm going to show you exactly how to use it um, from a teaching point of view. But um, the forebrain fine tunes the discrimination and processing of sounds. So if you're, if you're not quite getting that an ah is an ah, uh, sorry, uh, like say you you hearing the word cat, but you actually hearing cuts because you're hearing you can't discriminate between an a ah and an a. Ah. Um, we can work with that using the forebrain. So you talk into it, and actually, the the child will talk into it, and they will then start to really make sure that they're getting the difference between those sounds. So you're getting accurate um, sound awareness. It also helps the memory of letter sound patterns. It's really effective with that. Helps with fluency. So not only reading fluency, but verbal fluency. Um, it definitely improves attention. Um, I actually use it when I'm writing my diagnostic reports um, <coughs> because I talk them back to myself and that help, helps me hold what I'm, what I'm writing in my head. And then I can think, oh, hang on. Actually, I wanted to say that. Actually, I thought of that. And it's just the most, it's just one, when you put, when you wear it, you'll, it's just the most wonderful tool. It allows for the sub vocalization. So when you talk back to yourself, your memory is so much stronger. And if you're getting that information through bone conduction faster, um, you are, you then have got more time to process what um, you're hearing, basically. Um, it really helps develop reading and spelling skills. It improves reading comprehension. So I get all my pupils to read out loud. Um, and you wouldn't believe when they first sort of put it on and, and read with it. And they say, oh, I can't believe I, I'm actually, I can, I'm following what I'm reading. Um, it's really, you know, it's, it's wonderful when you see that. Um, and I thought for me, the impact of any support program I put in place is just so much faster um, because we really are much more accurate. How to introduce it. Um, so I always introduce it slowly. I give them a little demonstration. I'm going to show you now to put it on because it's a little, you can see I'm going to put it on here. And you can see where these little bone conductors sit just in front of the ear and then the microphone just sits just in front of your voice and then you talk talk into it so I put it on show so show my pupils what I look like with it on um, and then I get them to put it on I put it on them and then I, show, I, I use a mirror generally so that they can see what they look like um, sometimes if 
if the child's a little bit sort of anxious, um, you can talk, you switch it on, you can adjust the volume too. Um, and you just talk into it with them holding the bone conductor because it vibrates, the bone conductor vibrates. Um, and then put it on them and get them to talk very slowly. Now I introduce it very slowly just with sounds first um, so that they just get the use, uh, just get used to hearing themselves speak. <coughs> and then the secondary microphone that you plug in, this is what I use. And I, when, I, when we're working with sounds, I'll say it first, I'll get the child to repeat it. Um, of all the children I work with, 98% of them absolutely find, you know, it, it, it works really well. <coughs> I don't work with very sensitive children, and I know that very sensitive children do take a little bit longer. And if they they can find the sound of their own voice a little bit um, discombobulating sometimes. And in that case, just take it slowly, just do perhaps one or two sounds first, and then you know, very slowly introduce it over a number of weeks. Um, it just depends on the child. So it's really important going at their own pace. <laughs> um, we recommend sort of children under five, not more than 10 minutes um, at a time. Children over five, about 15. Um, so that's, a, you know, that's sort of a nice, <coughs> a nice um, guideline. Um, the children over five, sort of the, uh, you know, the older ones who've taken it really well, I can do it twice in a lesson. So 15 minutes at the beginning, and then I do a reinforcement exercise at the end for another 15 minutes. Um, it's quite tiring having it on when you're still getting used to it. You can use it in your in any therapy. So speech and language therapists, I know, use it. It's very effective. Occupational therapists, um, and obviously anyone teaching. Um, it's just... You know, so in I use it in my practice. I also um, recommend that um, all the children work at home. So they actually, and we'll, um, Dominique's going to talk about the affiliate pro program later, but it is good if the child can have their own forebrain that they use at home. And then I get them to do reinforcement exercises at home. Um, and then with, you know, if the mum or the dad or the carer could, you know, show them how to use it and use it and put it on while they're doing homework, um, reading, any reading. So any um, reading out loud. Um, so school homework reading, read out loud. You can read nursery rhymes are brilliant. Anything with a rhythm is fantastic because it's, it, you know, it's working with the rhythm of your voice, which then helps fluency. Uh, when you're doing spelling, so practicing sounding out, so you sound out as you're writing the words. Um, proofreading any written work that you've done, really, really fantastic. And as, of course, as the children get older, you can start to use it as a really fantastic proofreading um, and revision tool. Um, and so I do work with some children um, that are uh, sort of in uh, the higher stages of school. Um, and it's very effective as a revision tool. You know, if you've got your revision cards, you read them back to yourself, and that really helps the information stay in your in your long term memory. Um, any sorts of memorization that they do, I had uh, one of my little pupils had to do a um, a talk in front of the school. Um, in fact, I've just been teaching her, and she was very excited because she got into the finals, and she was practicing her speech using the forebrain. So again, just really lovely for her to hear how clear she was, but it also helps with the memory. Um, and then you can also get children to just talk with it. So, you know, creating stories. So using language, basically, um, inventing dialogue. Um, I'm going to talk about a case study now. I, I mean, I have you know, I have the, had the most wonderful results with lots of children, all fa fairly similar. And I do use a fairly similar approach. I fine tune it uh, depending on the child and, and their profile. 
Um, but this was a little girl, age nine, Sarah, who came to me. Um, I did her diagnostic assessment um, and her reading and spelling ages were really low. So two years below uh, expected levels. She didn't actually have all her letter sound links. So she didn't know when she saw the G, she thought it was a J. When she saw uh, B's and D, she was mixing up too. Um, but R, she was saying as a V. Um, so there was there were quite a few. Um, and you do find this, uh, I find this a lot. Um, you think that the child knows all their letter sounds, but they actually don't. Um, and they're not automatic. And that's what we want to get to. We want to get to this automaticity where all those core skills are literally automatic. You don't have to think about them. Then you've got more space in your working memory, you know, for the really fun stuff like um, using your, you know, curiosity or your imagination. Um, her verbal memory, phonological awareness and phonological processing were all low, um, either below average, so ranging between below average and in the low range. I've just put some standardized scores there. Um, and actually, the um, so she just wasn't processing sounds properly at all. Um, none. Um, and her processing, the rapid naming was was really challenging. So she would see a picture of a dog and she would say cat. Um, so you can see this fluency difficulty. Um, and writing, it was a lovely comment, actually. She said, um, it feels like there's no ink in my pen. And it, she just couldn't start writing. Um, and it was such a challenge. Um, and of course, you know, coupled with all specific learning difficulties, self-esteem drops, anxiety rises. And, um, and of course, that creates another, you know, layer of, of difficulties too. Um, I worked, I put a structured support plan in place using full brain. Um, I had one 60 minute lesson a week with her for a year. And she did daily reading at home with four brains. So I gave the mum specific things to work on that she practiced at home. She also did her spellings, actually, with the four, her school spellings at home. Um, I'm just going to go through the, the support program for reading because I think, you know, if you get that right, you can really make such fantastic strides um, and um, the impact's really quite quick as well. Um, so I always start off with um, phonological awareness exercises. Every single child I work with, I really um, get that we work at a sound level first. And that's what we use uh, the forebrain. I use the forebrain for all of this. But, um, you know, you put the forebrain on. I'm going to show you some pictures um, in a minute. Um, but really making sure that they are, are actually getting those sounds are really accurate. Um, I start with mid vowels first um, because they are, you know, really important. Making sure if you see that you're hearing a ah in a word and it is an a, ah, not an a eh or an e, eh, um, and that when you see the letter a, ah, you immediately can say the sound. Um, we then play around with. Um, manipulating sounds and I'll show you some uh, exercises with that so if I say cat now what is cat with an ah uh in the middle and they've got to say cat um, um, and then we say what you know what is the first sound in cat k what is the middle sound a uh, what is the last sound t and you you really do realize that those aren't automatic when you when you really start to dig deep and we need those to be really nice and clear. So I start with mid vowels first, then I get them to isolate the first sound, isolate the last sound, and then um, and then we start to change sounds. So you play with sounds. Then I always do explicit work mapping letters and sounds. So this is now looking at, a, at the picture of a letter and attaching a sound to it and manipulating those. I do some rapid naming exercises and I'm gonna show you those in a minute. Um, so just being able to see something and immediately generate the sound for it um, or the name 
name for it. And I do rapid naming of the high frequency words too. So those 100 high frequency words that are in 50% um, of everything we read. So you can imagine you get quite good gains if those are nice and, and fluent. Syllable division is really important too, being able to break up words. Um, and I use a really simple one um, so that there's not too much, too, too many rules. Rules are really difficult if you've got to learn too many rules. You just want something nice and simple. Um, I then build phonic patterns, introducing them always at a sound level first, playing with the sounds, then um, words, little silly sentences to practice and then practicing those words at a passage level. So there's a huge amount of reinforcement going on. And then we look at reading comprehension too. So inference, predicting text, um, being able to summarize what you've read, being able to imagine a story in your head too. So if I just show you um, quickly, the so you can see the sounds, I use concrete resources. So with the forebrain, say, if you look at that pig, I'll say um, with the forebrain on, and I'll be talking into that, into the secondary microphone. Let's say the word pig, pig, what does pig start with? P, and then I say a P, and the child says a P. Um, if I say dog, what's the middle sound in dog? Oh, and then I say an ah, oh, and they hear an ah, oh, and then they repeat it back, ah. Oh. So you can see there's a lot of, um, rip, you know, really analyzing and, and uh, uh, those sounds properly. Um, and then the middle picture, I've got, say the top one, three, I've got a dog, I've got a duck, and I've got a sun. And then I say, what does dog start with? Duh. What does sun start with? what does duck start with d and they've got the forebrain on and they're repeating that sound in so they're hearing that sound as they repeat it and then I say which two pictures have the same starting sound um, and then they you know they can circle that um, and then I move on to the so the third picture is letters so now starting to attach the letter sounds to links and I just use five letters at a time with the vowels um, and then we'll say cat and then um, make cat. Um, and I'm I'm asking them to repeat it in the forebrain. Um, and then I say, OK, change cat to cut. And they say cut. And then they've got to change the little magnetic letter to ah. Uh. So you can hear there's a lot of this manipulating, really fine tuning those sounds. Um, and then the first picture, say we're working on at. Uh, after we've really worked on the a at a sound level, I get them to um, highlight the as in the word so that they're seeing them first. And as they're highlighting them with the forebrain on, they're saying a every time. So you're getting this visual link to the sound link. Um, and then my middle picture, this is when I introduce blends. So I always introduce them at sound level first. So if we see the picture of the flag, now that this little girl, um, Sarah Falg, so she could, and this happens a lot. So, the, so then you say, no, no, what a, you know, let's think about flag, and then she says flag, and then of course it's all done with the the full brain, and then she links the full to those two little F L letters. I do also on this third picture um, some. Uh, visual tracking exercises and every time they see the bill they say it in in the forebrain um, microphone these are my examples of my rapid naming exercises so i just time the children and get them to say the word so say pig sun jug cat as fast as you can we do the letter sound links. I start with the vowels first, eh, 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 and they've got to say those at, as fast as they can. Um, and then you time them and you see how much faster they get. You know, you do this probably for five weeks in a row. Um, and then I'd start off with the first, these are the high frequency words. So just the first few. Um, so just getting them to say those fast using the forebrain as well. So you just get this fluency and automaticity of these words. 
Um, and then just talk a little bit about the spelling. So we worked on those regular CVC words first, um, consonant, vowel, consonant. Um, again, remember we're working at a sound level first. So once those are accurate, of course, um, it's, it's so much better. Then you sound out the letters, we're using the full brain, um, build the common 25 common words um, first, um, building them in, the, in, in magnetics and play, magnetic letters and Play-Doh, writing back a simple sentence, reading your sentence back and proofreading your work using full brain. So just a little example. These were irregular spellings and then I got Sarah to just proofread her sentence and then tick her words. And then you can see um, the, the second picture, again, just using tiny words that we had been working on the sounds, say if, sorry, spell if, and then she's got the forebrain on saying if, and then writing it. Okay, now write fib, fob, and you can see she's saying it and uh, writing it. So again, that accurate processing of sounds. Um, and then just the results after a year, really wonderful. So her reading age was one year above her reading accuracy. The best results were actually the single word reading and the phonemic decoding. Um, she went, in fact, I've got the schools here, but um, from word reading from 87 to 87 standard school to 124. Um, and the phonemic decoding again um, from 74 to 112, so huge leaps forward, um, just using that approach. Spelling went up to expected levels, which was actually brilliant. And then this massive improvement in phonological awareness and processing. Writing, suddenly now writing lovely sentences, passages, um, and, and the most exciting thing of all was the improvements in confidence um, and self-esteem. So really um, wonderful case study, actually. I'm going to pass you over to Dominique. Um, I'm aware that, of course, I've rattled on a bit too much, but she's going to tell you about our affiliate community now. Thank you, Kim. I've been answering some questions on the Q&A, and uh, we're all very, very happy with the great insight you, you're giving us. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so yes, earlier at the beginning of the webinar, um, we ta talked a little bit about the, the community of um, affiliate professionals. Sound for Life has thousands of professionals around the world registered to their affiliate programs, uh, speech and language pathologists, audiologists, coaches of all kinds, doctors, occupational therapists, and of course, many uh, public and private schools, um, as well as uh, special needs programs. So why do they affiliate themselves with Sound for Life? Well, because the entire program is focused on making it easy for professionals to recommend the product, but also to be rewarded for, for doing so. So our professionals are confident in recommending for Brain and representing its benefits to families who are in need because they get the support uh, that they need from our affiliate team. So how does it work? It's really very simple. There is no operational work for you to do or a financial investment needed. Of course, you, you need to buy your first unit so you can get familiar with the product and its benefits. But Sound for Life does everything on your behalf from stocking to shipping to returns and refunds. And you have a team of professionals backing you up. So after signing up, you get an email that will provide you with your affiliate number. Uh, you just give that number to any of your clients who are interested in purchasing for brain when they purchase with your affiliate number they will be able to see the discount that you're giving them at the time of purchase so after you create an account on the for brains website you can set up the discount at either 10 percent off or 30 percent of the the website's price commissions for orders with 10 percent discounts are 80 dollars or 72 euros per unit and commissions for orders with 30% discounts are $40 or 36 euros per unit. So inside your account, you'll have access to a wide range of information to help you recommend for brain. You will have marketing materials that you can email to your database of clients and professionals, flyers with your code that you can print and display at your practice, specific banners for your website and social media pages. 
And you can also, of course, uh, track all the purchases made with your um, affiliate number. So for the professionals who don't already have a Forbrain, uh, we are running a um, reading awareness campaign on Forbrain.com. And you can get your first unit with a 20% discount. Uh, also, if you ever have any questions about Forbrain or your account, we're always available to you through info, as in short for information, info at forbrain.com. Okay, so uh, we are now, Kim, going to the Q&A session. I, um, I've been answering some questions already, um, and, but we're gonna, there's some more coming through. I'm going to read them to you so we can go a little bit faster, if you agree. So Perfect. let's see, I got a lot of feedback about how um, valuable and interesting it is to our professionals to hear you uh, talk about your, your experience, you know, what you do, the exercises you do and, and how it translates. So I have uh, uh, Stefania now that says, thank you for the very important lecture. Would you suggest using Forebrain as a tool for language learning, both for dyslexic and non-dyslexic learners? Yes, um, I, I do. I mean, it's very powerful for dyslexic learners. I found, um, you know, with the children I work with, some, you know, sometimes their, their um, siblings who might not be dyslexic uh, try the forebrain. And um, as a study tool, it's really, really useful. So being able to revise using it, um, you know, you know, really going going through your revision notes or your, you know, your reading of your, um, especially as as the work becomes more and more complex and the language becomes more complex as you go further up school and and university too, is really effective. So for non dyslexic students, um, it it definitely helps your attention, um, but also helps. Um, yeah, it helps the memorization of the knowledge. Thank you, Kim. And for the, with my own experience, um, from my own experience, I can tell you that it can help um, with the acquisition of language. I, I work with a lot of uh, public schools here and uh, the uh, speech and language pathologists who focus on the ESL programs absolutely love using Forebrain because of uh, the bone conduction and the discrimination of sounds and so on. Everything that Kim uh, mentioned during your presentation so we have a little bit more questions. Uh, I've been using Forebrain from Mindy, uh, but I just have a student put it on and said, I can't hear anything. Volume was good and Forebrain was working. What could be the problematic? Um, Mindy, uh, I, I don't know if you played with the, the volume up and down or if your Forebrain has the second mic, um, but you know, know that each time you turn off the, the unit, uh, the, the sound goes back to its standard uh, volume. So you can play, um, you know, with the buttons going up and down and see if it feels better for your student. Um, you know, if, uh, if, you, if you continue to have issues with that, uh, I advise you to go to info at forbrain.com and, and get uh, support there. Thank you. So now from uh, Natsai Dunira, I have one and I've been given the code, but I do not have the marketing materials. We use it with my son and I recommend it to my clients with autism. So Natsaya, you, if you are currently uh, one of our affiliates, um, I also recommend that you go to info at forbrain.com and ask for their support there, uh, getting your, your credentials to enter your account because it's all there. It's all there with uh, documents with your own personal affiliate number. Thank you. All right, and from uh, Megan, the time limits, did you say you could build up to longer periods of time to wear it, like for a 40 to 60 minute session? Kim? I, um, I think it's quite tiring, especially with children that are, you know, that find sounds, uh, you know, tiring. Um, so I would, it does depend on the child. Um, I, I, you you can I mean you can go up I wouldn't do it for the whole hour session I think that would be too much but you could do go up to 20 minutes and then take a little break if you're doing an hour session 20 minutes take a 20 minute break and then do another 20 minutes so you could do the reading element uh, do something else and then you could do a spelling element um, 
at the end. Um, I, I, you'd probably also need, you know, the younger the child, the, the less they are able to, you know, take it for, you know, the, the less time, you know, the more time, you know, the less they need really. Um, they, they can find it quite tiring. Um, but kids that actually have, um, I sort of don't have sort of very sense, you know, real sensitivity issues, cope with it so well. I myself, you... when I'm doing my reports, um, I will have it on for a while. Yeah. And I, I do know I did a, a, a webinar a little while ago with um, one of the Tomatis consultants and she she uses it for, with adults and they use it for, for longer than the 15 minutes. That's right. And it's also my experience. It, it, it completely varies from person to person. The, the, the rule of thumb is always that uh, overstimulation can be counterproductive. So uh, you, were, you, you really have to work with that specific person and see how they feel. Uh, are they getting agitated? Are they complaining that they have uh, headaches, that they're bothered? It also depends if they are hyper or hyposensitive of sound. Um, uh, I've heard of... Um, uh, people on the autism spectrum will actually demand to have the headset on all day because they feel so grounded and connected. So it really, the experience is going to be completely different from person to person. So and, thank you. And Dominic, just quickly, the more you use it, the more grounded you feel in it too. That's, that's that is cool. my experience. Mm. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, Megan has another question. The time. Um, oh, sorry. So that's the, the other one is, do you have any uh, suggested activities to target attention, verbal memory, etc.? The interesting thing with verbal memory, because you, you get challenges with verbal memory when the sound processing is, is not right. Um, and suddenly, once you've got that all sorted out with that intensive intervention, the verbal memory improves. Um, using forebrain does help verbal memory too. So it does have a therapeutic effect. Um, and that's certainly what I've discovered. And particularly when they, as their reading develops and they're starting to read more, um, you start to see more, you know, they're able to remember more and more of what they're reading. And if they're talking into it, so if you, if they're talking back, if they're talking something, they hold that information so um, more than they do when they don't use the forebrain. So now we have a question from Ati Peterson. I have experienced forebrain uh, will relax kids and thus learning is easier and also language learning. This has been the case with both of my kids. One has the Midas touch and the other has dyslexia and ADHD inattentive. Thank you. Yes, the, um, uh, you you'd either get the energizing effect or you get the relaxing effect because of the, the grounding, the, the, uh, the discernment of sounds, the connection to the environment and, and the, uh, the ability to, to uh, hear yourself clearly and to feel connected to yourself and, and others. So that is absolutely the case. Uh, from Cindy, we have four brands truly really makes all the difference when teaching phoneme uh, awareness. I've seen the effect since 2017 when I purchased my first device. Yeah, it's brilliant. So Absolutely. nice to hear. Yeah, yeah the, the wonderful work. Absolutely. So from Cindy again, um, I use a timer to ensure a student is not wearing the device too long. Sometimes it can cause discomfort in the area where the conductor are resting. Very true. Very true. Very true. I generally monitor the children, so I watch them, and you can see them starting to get a little bit fatigued, and then you take it off. Yeah. And let's see. So Cindy tells us that it's also important to use forebrain with fidelity. Hold on, let me scroll down. It takes time to see improvement for most. I, yes, it does. I, I was telling uh, Kim that I have um, a child who is mildly dyslexic. And when we started using Forebrain, it took me two months to see that creation of new neural pathways. Two, two months to see that the brain has suddenly uh, unlocked. And, and at, at that point, uh, my child was able to uh, read better, uh, comprehend, 
was able to re read long words. You mentioned that earlier, Kim. She stopped trying to make up words. And thanks to Forebrain, um, little by little, she was getting to that place where reading was uh, a joy and not a, not a chore. Yeah, it's lovely when they, when they get to that stage. And I think the other important thing, which I actually didn't mention, is that it is a really slow and steady journey. And depending on the severity of the dyslexia, uh, will depend on how long it takes. And it's just so important to just go in tiny steps and, you know, even if they only learn one word a week, that's actually progress. Um, and, you know, it, you know, it can be really, really, really slow. And that's fine. You know, um, it's just the important thing is to go at their pace and to, to have a really nice methodical approach. OK, so um, <laughs> Cindy tells us that slow and steady wins the race. Yes. <laughs> yes, Definitely. it does. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> All right. So right now, um, OK, so Caitlin just came through. Is this useful for children with sensory processing problems? And the answer is yes, it, it is. Uh, it has been developed to help with sensory and auditory uh, auditory processing difficulties. So over time, um, yeah, you, you see those improvements. Um, you can adjust the volume of the headset uh, to the, the, the optimal listening uh, level for that specific person. So uh, we have seen a lot of uh, improvements also in that area. Yes. And then Daniel says that once um, he had someone use a forebrain who had severe auditory processing disorder as well as anxiety, she was wearing forebrain in normal conversations and it was too much for her. She couldn't handle both that in, in interaction with others. Yeah, so that can happen. It, it, it really depends on, uh, you know, yeah, the level of difficulty. Uh, again, we're ta we talked about overstimulation earlier. Um, the bone conduction element in forebrain can be overwhelming for those who are uh, hypersensitive of sound. So, yeah, thanks, Daniel. And I think in that situation, you know, perhaps not using it as in language, you know, talking with other people around because you're getting the interference from a lot of different voices. So in those situations, just use forebrain in a one-to-one -one environment. Okay, so right now we don't have any more questions. And we have one more minute. So don't hesitate, attendees, if you have... Um, more questions for Kim, that's your chance. If you've got any other questions that you think of later, please just email us and, and we'll, we'll respond to you. Yeah, you can always send an email to info at forebrain.com um, and we will, we will answer. And uh, if the questions are directly for Kim, we will make sure that uh, she gets to your emails. Lisa just came through and asked, uh, will the recordings be available for review? Yes, Lisa, um, the recording will be sent to you uh, after, later on. You will, get, you will get it through email. And Caitlin says, can you say more about how it helps with sensory processing issues? I think um, because I normally work with, so from the auditory processing, which is the children I work with that have auditory processing difficulties, rather than if it's a specific sensory integration uh, difficulty. So it just depends on, would you mind perhaps um, being what type of sensory processing? Would you mind clarifying that? From an auditory processing point of view, um, it's very effective um, because it really does fine tune the discrimination of sounds, um, the uh, holding of, so your memory of sounds, which is your verbal memory, um, and also um, the fluency, so the, the ability to be able to generate the language. Um, um, so yeah, it, it's very effective for that. All right, so we, Kathleen uh, just came through. 
child has not been diagnosed, but she self-regulates by pushing, pulling, tugging, and lifting uh, physical activities. That I would I would definitely look at an occupational therapist for that because that sounds like there's a lot of um, probably vestibular um, challenges. It's that's not my special field. I do work with occupational therapists, but um, that looks like you know there's a there's a host of of other um, sensory um, challenges there that would probably be you know that would with some occupational therapy would um, be helped. Yeah, and Caitlin, you can always look at uh, at Sensory, the, the the other headset um, developed by Sound for Life, because it is uh, specifically for, to help with um, movement balance coordination, sensory auditory processing disorders, and so on. And it, it's pretty much occupational therapy in a box. A lot of OTs use it at their practice, so you may want to go check the website and see, uh, you know, how it could help. All right, so um, it's past 3 p.m. Uh, Central here in the U.S. We don't have any more questions, so I think we're going to wrap up. Kim, thank you very much for, you know, this uh, amazing presentation that you gave us. Uh, Stefania just, uh, again, is giving us a message. Thank you very much. Um, all of you participants will have the presentation after, and uh, we're here for you if you have any other questions. Uh, Kim and I will make sure that uh, that we support you. Kim, thank you so much. Caitlin thank came you. through. I, I appreciate all the information and instruction. Thank you, Cindy. It was excellent. Thank you very much. And Mindy, thank you so much for the lovely webinar. We appreciate you very much. And uh, hopefully you'll come um, listen to our next webinar soon. You'll have the email. Um, and thank you for your time. Kim. <laughs> thank you thank you we so appreciate much. you you take oh, care goodbye everyone bye-bye thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.